papers about uh, the different effects of the name, such as getting a taste, uh, tasting the bliss, ever increasing bliss, etc., uh, and wiping out the dirt in the heart. That was to do with faith. And then the second verse about the glories of the holy name and its powers, uh, and one's own position of uh, inability to appreciate it. That was considered to be bhajana kriya, uh, sadhu sangha bhajana kriya, and anarta in the vritti. Uh, and uh, in relation to that, we discussed the anartas and how the holy name is so powerful that it can uh, destroy all the anartas. So the third verse is uh, nishta stage, after the anartas are moderately destroyed. This is a very famous verse that also occurs in Chaitanya Charitamrita not only at the end, but uh, in relation to the story of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, getting his initiation. And then he relates how his guru gave him this instruction. Apart from getting ma uh, Krishna mantra, he gave him this instruction that you should always remember this particular verse. So therefore it's a very important verse. Trinadapi sunichena taror ivasa hishnuna Amanina Amanadena Kirtaniya Sada Harihi. Ah, so uh, we have here uh, uh, some comparisons given. Uh, one should be lower than the grass. Uh, so that is what Trina. Trina is grass. Nietzsche is low. Sunicha is very low. <laughs> so grass is automatically low because it's on the ground and it doesn't grow very high. So its very nature is to be humble, so you should be, by your nature, should have this humility like the grass and be very low. Huh? And you should be more tolerant than a tree. Huh? Uh, so the, uh, that lowness is an attitude of the devotee, uh, which we can say is humility, which is a very important aspect of bhakti. And in fact, um, it's not going to go so I mean, relates uh, this uh, humility to uh, becoming more and more prominent as we progress in bhakti until when we get to prema then it becomes very very intense and as we go through the different rasas finally we get up to madhurya rasa so the gopis have the most humility of all and so it goes along with the whole process of bhakti and its development so actually it's also there in the very beginning and uh, we also see it as part of the process of surrender uh, or sharanagati. There are six aspects of sharanagati like accepting what is favorable and rejecting what is unfavorable and taking the Lord as one's master. So one of them is uh, feeling very small and miserable in front of the Supreme Lord. Uh, so uh, Jiva Goswami also says that this uh, sharanagati is the first anga of bhakti so in beginning bhakti, we should also cultivate this humility from the very beginning. And of course, here Lord Chaitanya says, uh, if you, uh, you can sing or chant the glories of the Lord or chant the holy name, if you are continuously, if you have this humble attitude. So it goes along with the process of <coughs> hearing and chanting and the process of bhakti. Very, very important element. Uh, one has no desire for personal honor uh, and is ready to give honor to all others. We respect all others and we're indifferent to getting praise and honor ourselves. Uh, so these are the four uh, elements here uh, of uh, the devotee which are very, very important. And therefore Lord Chaitanya says uh, this was given by his guru as an instruction that when you're chanting you always have to do this. Yeah. So there are many verses that talk about humility. Uh, for instance, there's this verse, the six divisions. Uh, this is the actually the, as I said, the uh, one of the elements of surrender. Uh, uh, this apnikshepa uh, karpanya. Karpanya is this uh, being very uh, humble and uh, 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 at the end, I say, uh, full surrender, which is Atmanikshepa, and then we have humility at the end. So these are the six aspects of surrender. So, uh, therefore, humility is involved there. Uh, 
two kinds of tolerance. Uh, the tree is considered to be very tolerant or sahishnu. Uh, uh, so, so people can come and cut off the branches of the tree uh, or the leaves or the fruit or the flowers and it, it doesn't protest. It just tolerates that situation. Yeah. And uh, and also doesn't ask anybody for anything. If the water comes, it accepts the water. If the water does not come, it tolerates that situation. So in this way, it tolerates all conditions of life. And even when uh, uh, attacked by others, does not protest. So that's uh, tolerance. Uh, and like... Um, a desire tree, uh, the tree gives. Uh, if, it, if somebody wants something from the tree, uh, it will give shelter, it will give shade uh, from heat or rain, uh, it will give fruit uh, or flowers or whatever. So, uh, of course, uh, it's not the ultimate desire tree, but whatever it can do, it gives uh, willingly to all beings. So in other words, it shows compassion also. Okay. So tolerance and compassion are there in the tree. So we have humility, tolerance and compassion as uh, characteristics in this verse. Very, very important. And the Vaishnava, of course, is very great by nature and he is worshipable by all persons and he gets the respect of all living entities. Still, he shows no pride. Uh, he doesn't want position. At the same time, he gives respect to all other living entities. Uh, since they are uh, the servants of Krishna and the abodes of the Supreme Lord also. Uh, so all of these principles are um, inherent in the process of bhakti. On their own, they look like material qualities that people can cultivate. Uh, but these qualities are also in relation to the Supreme Lord. Why do we uh, show compassion for all living entities uh, uh, like the tree? Uh, because we understand that we are all servants of Krishna. Uh, why are we humble? Because automatically we are servant, we're not the master. Uh, why do we show respect to all living entities? Because we know that they are also uh, amsas of the Supreme Lord uh, and the Supreme Lord is also dwelling in all living entities including not only oneself but them as well so by honoring the living entity we're also honoring the Supreme Lord uh, so uh, and of course uh, if we are the servant of the Lord then we give respect to the Lord and we don't expect respect for ourselves. Uh, so in other words by s simply thinking ourselves as Krishna Das, or the servant of Krishna, uh, we should imbibe these different uh, qualities. Right? So, that understanding that we're the servant of Krishna, not the master, is inherent in the very process of bhakti. If we don't accept that, we cannot do bhakti at all. Okay? So, even if we want faith, uh, the faith must include not only acceptance of the Supreme Lord that He exists, but also we have to accept our position as servant of the Lord. If we don't do that, we can't do bhakti. So our faith involves the, uh, also this idea of uh, we are the eternal servant of Krishna. So that's the, uh, in, let's say the initial uh, fact that we have to accept in our devotional service. So along with that comes all of these qualities. And therefore, when we are uh, practicing devotion or chanting the holy name, uh, then these qualities should manifest along with the uh, uh, chanting as part of our bhakti. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next verse is the next stage. We have uh, nishta, so one can, after the uh, anartas, we chant the holy name with great faith, and the power of the holy name is such that it removes all the obstacles, uh, and our bhakti grows until we get to the uh, nishta stage where the good qualities become more prominent. 
we see in nectar devotion the the first two qualities of bhakti that manifest are kleshagni and subhada to manifest uh, uh, good qualities subhada and to destroy suffering karmas material desires etc uh, so if we uh, come to the stage of nishta then we will see the good qualities manifesting and the bad qualities disappearing so uh, therefore these qualities of uh, being humbler than a blade of grass and more taller than a tree and not um, looking for respect these will automatically manifest as we come to the uh, nishta stage uh, and these will be fixed qualities at that stage along with the process of bhakti uh, so we continue if we continue the process of chanting then the uh, bhakti increases our taste increases mm -hmm. this was mentioned in the first verse there's a, a asvada or a taste uh, for uh, the sweetness of the holy name and uh, this increases gradually uh, and at a certain stage uh, we're able to appreciate that taste in the beginning uh, there's a little taste but then we have all of the anartas that cover it up but as we get to nishta and progress further uh, bhakti becomes very prominent so the, the taste in the process of chanting becomes uh, stronger uh, so this verse uh, expresses this idea that we are no longer attracted to material things nadanam nadjanam nasundarim kavitam va jigadisha kama e Mama Jamani Jamani Shvare Bhavatad Bhakti Rahitiki Twayi. So the desire it is a desire for uh, pure bhakti to the Supreme Lord birth after birth without any other desire. So that is the uh, we can say the result of constantly uh, practicing devotion. We reach the stage where we no longer have attraction to things material and uh, the attraction to Krishna is increased. Uh, if we continue to have these gross uh, attachments and uh, things like anger and pride and lamentation, attachment to children and wife or husband, then uh, this verse says, no possibility of Krishna manifesting. If we're more attached to material things, why would Krishna manifest to us? He's only going to manifest when there is significant attachment to the Lord and much, much less attachment to material things. Okay. So, uh, Nishta stage, as we can say, is a little bit neutral. That's where you've got enough attraction to Krishna that your uh, anartas don't interfere with your bhakti. And if we get more attraction to Krishna and uh, the Ruchi stage, then definitely the uh, negative qualities begin to uh, disappear. They're not so prominent anymore. They don't create a very much of an obstacle. Uh, so that, that is the case of uh, Ruchi stage. Uh, so at this stage, of course, the devotee is attracted to everything uh, uh, related to Krishna, including chanting the holy name. And uh, he rejects uh, other things. So, one of the uh, principles of bhakti is um, to accept what is necessary for maintenance and not to accept too much. And this is a preliminary anga of bhakti among the first 20, actually in the first 10. Uh, that we, we take what we need, but we don't take too much. The person with wisdom concerning material objects accepts as much as is necessary for maintenance of bhakti. By accepting more or less than that, the person will fail to attain the highest goal. So, too less means that we renounce everything uh, and we have, we're not really qualified for such renunciation. It's not coming spontaneously. Thus, we uh, struggle to maintain that austerity and this creates, creates a disturbance in our sadhana yeah? so we don't renounce too much yeah? on the other hand uh, if we don't have enough renunciation we cannot practice bhakti because we get involved in enjoying the senses so we become very unsteady so not too much attachment and not complete detachment so we don't accept more we don't accept less but we do what is necessary to maintain our 
devotion at a constant level. Bhakti develops and then the taste develops. This is a verse from the 11th canto of Bhagavatam, a very famous verse. Devotion, direct experience or realization of the Supreme Lord and detachment from other things. These three occur simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the same way as pleasure, nourishment and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. So when you eat then, you, if it's nice food, you've got a nice taste and you enjoy it, eh? you also get free of hunger and you also get nourished. There's no extra endeavor there when you eat. All three things take place. So when you do the process of bhakti, then the devotion increases, uh, we get an experience of the Lord, and we become detached from other things. These things happen automatically with the process of bhakti. Very, very uh, powerful process to uh, create detachment automatically with a direct experience of the Supreme Lord. At the stage of Ruchi, and then uh, as explained in Madhurya Kadambani, uh, the attraction for uh, hearing and chanting is much, much greater than the engagement of the senses for material enjoyment. So that's why it's called Ruchi or taste. Because the taste is strong, we don't get tired of performing bhakti. We can go on for long periods of time uh, hearing or chanting or studying or whatever and we don't get tired uh, because the taste is there. Uh, just as if there's delicious food you can eat and you don't fall asleep when you're eating. <laughs> so when you <laughs> when you're, uh, have a ruchi for uh, doing kirtan then you don't fall asleep also. You have no fatigue. Uh, so when we do, uh, have this ruchi, this automatically creates more and more taste. The process becomes more and more spontaneous because of that taste. Huh? At this position of taste, then, uh, the devotee understands his previous condition was very pitiful. Before bhakti, he was completely hopeless. Huh? And even the previous stages of bhakti were not uh, advanced enough. So when he understands the taste for the Lord is so uh, is so sweet, then he understands his previous bhakti was also not so great. Uh, he hears and chants in the association of devotees, so he has sadhu sangha. He rejects all material engagements and takes refuge of the holy dham. So in this way he uh, is uh, becoming more and more attached to everything related to the Lord and rejecting everything else. The Nartas are not gone, they're still there, but they're much, much less. The bhakti is much greater, and when we have this much bhakti, then the process becomes much easier. Hmm. From ruchi to asakti uh, is, uh, you say, quite, it's, 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 asakti is a similar stage. Uh, where there's more attachment to the Lord and less material attraction. Uh, so that great attachment is expressed in this verse of, uh, in which the uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is uh, um, aspiring to uh, only think of the lotus feet of the Lord and being like a particle of dust at the lotus feet of the Lord being his eternal servant. O oh Krishna, son of Nanda, I am your eternal servant, but I have fallen into this dreadful ocean of material existence. Please be merciful and think of me as a speck of dust at your lotus feet. So this is the aspiration of the uh, devotee who is very attached to the Lord. Uh, he understands that he's a fallen jiva, so therefore I say, I'm in, fall, I've fallen into this dreadful ocean of material existence. But his attraction to the Lord is actually very great at Asakti. It's right next to realizing the Lord. So though he expresses a very humble attitude, he's quite exalted at this stage. But he sees himself as very fallen. So we saw previously that uh, Trinadapi Sunichena, one is lower 
than a blade of grass. So that's how the devotee thinks of himself. And therefore we see that expressed in this verse. I'm just at the, in the ocean of material existence and I only aspire to be a particle of dust at your feet. So he puts himself in a very low position. We find even the highest devotees will say the same thing. And even the gopis will pray like this. So this is natural for the devotees of the Lord. At this stage, attachment to the Lord uh, is uh, greatly as much superior to the attachment to Maya. It was so somewhat in Ruchi's stage, but it's more so with uh, Asakti stage. Asakti means attachment. So the attachment has become much greater at this stage. Uh, this is from the fort, uh, 14th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, the prayers of Lord Brahma. One who earnestly await, waits for you to bestow your mercy upon him, uh, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds, and passes his life by offering respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body, is the rightful claimant of you, the shelter of liberation. So this expresses the uh, the devotee's firm attachment to the Supreme Lord in all cases. He may be suffering in the material world physically, but he does not give up his attachment to the Supreme Lord at all. He continues to worship him. It says here with the uh, heart, words, and body, uh, he offers his respects. And because of that, he is a rightful claimant of the Supreme Lord. In other words, by having this attitude of complete attachment to the Lord in all circumstances, the Lord becomes very merciful and he gives himself to the devotee. So the more we become attached to the Lord, the more the Lord becomes attached to the devotee. That's the basic principle. Here we have a more exalted example. We have the example of the gopis. Therefore, O vanquisher of all distress, please show us mercy. To approach your lotus feet, we abandon our families and homes, and we have no desire other than to serve you. Our hearts are burning with intense desires generated by your beautiful smiling glances. O jewel among men, please make us your maidservants. So this is another uh, request or prayer. May I become your servant. Dehi Dasyam, please give me the position of being a, a humble servant at your lotus feet. So the devotee has a very strong attachment to serving the Supreme Lord. This of course is an expression of the gopis who are already at the highest stage of perfection in Prema, but they put themselves in this humble position, I just want to be your servant. They're not saying I, I want to be your consort or anything, I just want to be your servant. A very, very humble position again. This is the verse from Stavavali. How is it possible to immerse oneself in the ocean of Shama Rasa, which can refer to love of Krishna, or it can refer to Madhurya Rasa, because Shama, or dark blue, is the color of Madhurya Rasa without worshipping the dust of the lotus feet of Srimati Radharani, or without taking shelter of Vrindavan, which is decorated with her footprints, or without serving her devotees, whose grave hearts are always absorbed in love of her. Again, we have this uh, extreme desire to uh, serve the Lord somehow or other, but to do that, uh, if we want to serve Krishna, then we have to serve Radha, or the devotees of Radha, or her Dham Vrindavan. So this is an expression of uh, uh, great attachment to the Lord and aspiring to uh, meet the Supreme Lord. That is the stage of Asakti. This is one difference between Ruchi and Asakti. In Ruchi's stage, one becomes very attached to the process of hearing and chanting. That's the Ruchi, the taste is in the uh, hearing and chanting. In Asakti, the taste is for Krishna himself in the hearing and chanting. In other words, when we 
uh, do the chanting process we're beginning to taste Krishna himself in the ruchi we're attached to the uh, we get a taste for the process of singing or chanting the Lord's name or hearing the Lord's uh, glories but here in uh, asakti then Krishna becomes the object of attachment so the reali we're getting closer to the realization of Krishna here thus very very advanced In Ruchi's stage, uh, we have to make some efforts to withdraw ourselves from material objects and uh, become attached to the Lord. In Asakti's stage, it becomes quite spontaneous that we simply attach ourselves to Krishna. That is because the attachment is much, much greater here. Verse 6. We know that from Asakti one comes to Bhava and then in Bhava stage one gets a realization of the Lord in Asakti there's uh, like a reflection of a realization of the Lord we almost see the Lord but in Bhava stage we actually perceive the Lord and when that happens then we develop these external symptoms called Sattvika Bhavas so that's expressed in this verse where we see uh, tears in the eyes, choked up voice, and hair standing on end. These are three of the sattvika bhavas. When my eyes be filled with tears, my throat blocked with a faltering voice, and all the hairs on my body stand erect as I chant your holy name. Often we'll see descriptions of the associates of Lord Chaitanya with these symptoms, or Lord Chaitanya also. Or we'll see in the Bhagavatam, many uh, devotees having these symptoms of crying, or hair standing on end, or choked voice, or fainting, or trembling, or change of color. So there are uh, eight primary sattvika bhavas. And these indicate the arous arousal of great emotion. That is, we've, we've developed a, uh, a stai bhava, part of rasa for Krishna, through our, uh, because of our sadhana. Mm -hmm. In the Nectar of Devotion, we have a whole list of some of the characteristics besides having a darshan of the Supreme Lord. But we get some other symptoms called anubhavas, or, or activities of the devotee. He's very tolerant, as we saw tolerance was also from the very beginning very important. Not wasting time on material activities. He's always absorbed in hearing and chanting about the Lord. No pride. That again was in that verse of the uh, the uh, Trinadapi verse, Amani Namanadena, having no pride. He's very confident in the Lord's mercy, detached from enjoyment. He has a great longing for the Lord. He has a taste for chanting the name of the Lord, as in Ruchi and Asakti. Attachment, discussing about the Lord's qualities. So uh, he chants, uh, and he also, uh, the name of the Lord. Uh, he discusses about the Supreme Lord, or hears about the discussions of the Lord, and he lives in the abode of the Lord, uh, Dham. These are the uh, characteristics of a person on Bhava stage. A very advanced stage in which one gets these Sattvika Bhavas because of uh, realizing the Supreme Lord. We see in the Bhagavatam even for Vishnu, if one realizes Vishnu, one will get similar uh, uh, symptoms. Prahlad Maharaj or uh, Dhruva Maharaj will get these symptoms. Bharat Maharaj attained Baba stage and he saw Vishnu and then he had symptoms like crying and shivering and hair standing on etc. So we get these uh, symptoms in the Baba stage. They are not um, things we imitate, they are simply byproducts of emotion. So the word Sattvika Bhava uh, refers to a state of sattva. So sattva means an intense emotion internally. And then it manifests externally as the sattvika bhava, as crying, etc. So there's some internal emotion and it manifests externally. And then it becomes tears or choking of the voice, um, fainting, etc. Uh, so the uh, state of bhava is considered to be the preliminary state of prema because 
there is realization of the Lord there are sattvika bhavas or ecstatic symptoms uh, and uh, the two processes are continuous one next to the other so they're very similar but mm, prema is more intense the realization is more complete the rasa is more complete the bliss is more intense okay. so in bhava stage there are sattvika bhavas but there's a few it's not constant and they're not all of them at once in prema then sometimes the, the sattvika bhavas all manifest simultaneously in a person and the sattvika bhavas are more continuous because one sees Krishna more often in the bhava stage one does not see the Lord all the time only occasionally and there's only occasional sattvika bhavas thus the uh, stage of uh, bhava is preliminary to prema but it is very very similar but less intense this is just a list of the bhavas uh, stunned means you can't move trembling like this perspiring hair standing on it fading of color you may turn white you may turn red you may turn black according to the emotion weeping or crying uh, choking of the voice and fainting these are the symptoms and we see these uh, in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu if you read the Chaitanya Charitamrita uh, he will do this in Navadweep and in Puri and in Vrindavan he had all these symptoms manifesting very remarkably there are also Anubhavas that manifest uh, Anubhavas are conscious activities sattvika bhavas do not require any thinking they simply manifest because of the emotions so you don't think I'm going to cry and start crying and you just cry <laughs> and you may try to suppress it and still it happens or you, you don't think I'm going to start trembling and start trembling uh, they're, they're automatic mm, involuntary external symptoms but we do have voluntary or intentional actions also these are called Anubhavas ah, this is just a list oh, well, dancing is an Anubhava so out of joy for the Lord one can dance one can roll on the ground one can sing one can cry out loudly uh, one can have bodily contortions or uh, yelling etc uh, yawning deep breathing disregard for others frothing of saliva mad laughter spitting and hiccups these are considered to be some of the Anubhavas uh, which have a conscious element in them so these will also manifest as one has a realization of the Supreme Lord we see these also manifesting in Lord Chaitanya at uh, different times and in the devotees, different devotees there's also many examples given in the nectar devotion when discussing that verse 7 is obviously a description of separation and the great anxiety and pain that separation causes this is very prominent in prema uh, so uh, at this stage uh, just blinking of the eye causes one uh, an obstruction to one seeing the Lord so one thinks that it's a yuga uh, a long long period of eye just blinking your eye because you cannot see the Lord for that period of time and one gets into great anxiety so that is the the uh, feeling of the devotee in separation from the Lord of course this type of uh, a, a feeling is actually in the gopis most of all more than the cowherd boys or Madhya Soda it's uh, very typical of Madhurya Rasa that one will feel that uh, a moment of the blinking of the eyes like a yuga hmm? uh, thus uh, a very very uh, intense uh, form of uh, emotion arises in separation and therefore it's considered to be uh, one of the topmost expressions of prema in separation it has an element of pain because we know that in separation one has all sorts of uh, symptoms of uh, you know suffering 
and in the gopis uh, this uh, separation goes to rather extreme levels uh, which are depicted in the Srimad Bhagavatam mm. uh, so uh, one, uh, one, one symptom is intolerance of separation even for a moment uh, uh, so that one moment of separation becomes like a kalpa of time thousands and thousands of years yeah. and even if Krishna is happy uh, one will have a feeling that maybe he's not happy and getting great anxiety uh, so therefore this happens sometimes when the uh, gopis or even the queens of Dwarka are with Krishna then they, they get in great anxiety that maybe he's going to leave and therefore they get more in anxiety so even in meeting there is a sense of separation as well so it, in other words a very very uh, intense feeling of separation and in this state we get very very high levels of uh, Madhurya Rasa which are not uh, found in other Rasas also So uh, we get the stage called Ruda Bhava, and then it becomes Adi Ruda huh? in separation, and then it becomes Modana and Madana. These are described in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, Modana is a condition in which the couple exhibits all sattvic uh, bhavas in extreme, very extreme state, a very intense. Uh, all the eight sattvic bhavas manifest together. Uh, for Krishna or Radha or the gopis that's called Modana yeah. and Modana is a situation that only manifests in Radha <laughs> she gets the highest um, bhavas there's also different types of separation uh, in actually in relation to all types of devotees even Sakirasa or Vatsalirasa or Dasirasa or even Shantarasa there's feelings of separation uh, and they're analyzed as a separation before even meeting the Lord like the Pandavas didn't meet the Lord until uh, after he uh, left Mathura so but they were already grown up but they'd heard about Krishna so they had great feelings of separation from him and then finally they met him so that in the gopis that type of stage is called poor viraga so the gopis see Krishna and Vrindavan but they don't really talk to him and as they grow up they gradually become a little more attracted to him a little more attracted to them until when they're approaching Kaishor age they get very great attraction to him but they're not saying anything yet to him that's called poor viraga then finally when the Krishna played his flute in the Rasalila in the autumn season when they were in Kaishor age then they all ran off to Krishna and they met him and they started speaking to him so that was the end of the poor Viraga so that one year before that were gradually they're becoming more and more attracted to Krishna but they can't really say anything this is called poor Viraga separation before actually meeting him in person another type of separation is in Man, when uh, the gopis like Radha become angry at Krishna and they refuse to meet him then there's separation and then in that separation then Krishna feels very dejected and even Radha feels very dejected but it's a purposeful separation because of Man or anger of Radharani uh, so that's one state of separation also uh, and then we have Pravas which means prolonged separation such as when uh, not only prolonged but even other separations when uh, Krishna goes to herd the cows in the morning then Yasoda is standing there and then she doesn't want Krishna to leave but then Krishna says well I have to go and herd the cows and I have to play with the cowherd boys so I'll, I'll go away and then I'll come back in the evening but the mother Yasoda doesn't want him to leave so then eventually she lets him leave because it's the duty to herd the cows but then all day long she's feeling separation from Krishna so this is the physical separation for mm, uh, some length of time then we get a very prolonged separation as when Krishna leaves Vrindavan 
and goes to Mathura and then to Dwarka. So in that case, the feeling of separation becomes most intense. And we get the most intense uh, descriptions, such as uh, Radha speaking to the bumblebee, etc. So that's a symptom of that, that, that great separation from Krishna. Uh, so in that prolonged separation, we get uh, intense forms of uh, ecstasy and separation. Hmm. Well, this is actually expressed by Madhavendra Puri in this famous verse. O my Lord, O merciful Master, O Master of Mathura, when shall I see you again? Because of my not seeing you, my agitated heart has become unsteady. O most beloved one, what shall I do now? So Madhavendra Puri is in the, mm, taking the mood of a gopi in separation from Krishna when he's gone off to Mathura. When there is separation, then we get different types of uh, different symptoms, such as thinking or worrying, sleeplessness, cannot go to sleep, wood vega, very agitated, uh, tanava meaning getting thin, the body becomes very thin, uh, molinata, the body becomes completely contaminated and soiled, they don't clean themselves, pralapa, they chatter meaninglessly, no meaning to the words they speak. Unmada, madness, they do all sorts of crazy things. Vyadi, they start getting sick with fever. Uh, we see this in the case of uh, Yasoda sometimes, and she falls down and uh, she has to go to bed, etc. And the, the gopis try to give her medicines and cool her down, but nothing will cool her down. That is Vyadi, or sickness. Fainting, moha and death-like, not actual death, but death-like symptoms where they almost stop breathing because of their uh, uh, feelings of separation from Krishna. We have very intense symptoms in Vipralamba, like that, as Krishna, when Krishna leaves. The feeling of separation, or the separation, must be followed by, uh, it has to resolve that pain of separation has to resolve somehow and therefore there is a meeting again which is called Samboga. Of course where there's Provaraga then finally Krishna meets the gopis in the Raslila but then and then uh, when uh, Krishna goes away in the fields in the morning comes back at night then there is meeting with the uh, Yasoda and Nanda again and uh, when Krishna goes away from Vrindavan and goes to Mathura and Dwarka, what happens? In the Bhagavatam we don't have a direct description of him coming back at all, which sounds very disastrous. Because Krishna should fulfill the desires of the people of Vrindavan. And he promised he would come back. If he did not come back, then he breaks his promise. If he breaks his promise, how is he Supreme Lord? Does he tell lies? So our acharyas say that actually he did come back. Yeah, but it's mentioned a little bit uh, secretly in the Bhagavatam, um, but more explicitly explained in the Padma Purana. In the Padma Purana there it explains that uh, Krishna returned after killing Dantavakra, and then he stayed with the uh, people of Vrindavan ever after and he sent his expanded form back to Dwarka to continue his pastimes there until he disappeared. In this way he fulfilled his promise to the people of Vrindavan and finally came back. So when Krishna comes back uh, with the gopis this uh, this reunion after separation is called Samboga and that's expressed in uh, different uh, ways. And so that's uh, in, the, in the last verse I'm Krishna's maid servant, he is the storehouse of all joy, whether he should embrace me or make me his own or not allow me to see him and cause my body to suffer and my mind to suffer, body and mind to suffer, he is still my only Lord in life. Finally, there must be some sort of union. When the relationship of love between the couple remains always without destruction, when there are causes for destroying it, it's called prema. Uh, if you have uh, interruptions to your love as in the case of the gopis in Vrindavan because their parents were trying to stop them and they had to go out secretly at night 
and the husbands for getting angry, why, where are you going, etc. This is all obstacle. In spite of the obstacle, if that prem continues, or that love continues, it's called prema. It overcomes all obstacles. What are the types of samboga? So we had purvaraga was the separation, and then we have, after that, uh, uh, samchipta samboga, which means abbreviated enjoyment. Uh, so that's a type of meeting. Uh, we have separation due to man, where Radha becomes angry and then she refuses to see Krishna. So we have uh, a, a meeting called Sankirna Samboga. Uh, when we have a temporary separation, as uh, Krishna having to leave the gopis in the morning and then later on, midday, he meets them again, uh, that's called Sampanna Samboga. Uh, comes back to them after some time. Hmm? And then we have coming back after a long separation. So it's called Samridhi Matsamboga. So that takes place when uh, Krishna returns after many years to Vrindavan after killing Dantavakra. And then he resides with the people of Vrindavan forever and with the gopis forever. So that's called Samridhi Matsamboga. Uh, which uh, Samridhi Mat means ever increasing attachment which indicates that after this he doesn't go away again. Mm -hmm. So in this way the uh, separation is finally resolved and uh, Krishna is permanently with the people of Vrindavan. After that then of course it happens this, uh, this they enter into the eternal pastimes and then there is no separation here they continue eternally uh, being together. That's the Samboga. The devotees are uh, supposed to meditate on these verses which mm, depict the progress of bhakti to the highest levels and uh, try to uh, develop a similar mood uh, of devotion. Here is a particular uh, verse uh, talking about the uh, being das das anudas, servant of the servant of the servant. I'm not a Brahman, nor I am a Kshatriya, nor a Vaisha, nor a Sudra. I am neither Brahmachari, nor Householder, nor Retiree, that's Manaprasta, nor I'm a Sannyasi. Instead, I make this claim, I'm a servant to the servant, to the servant of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, who is the lover of the gopis, the overflowing ocean of nectar, and the only source of supreme and immortal joy. This is the aspiration of the devotee, simply to be a servant of the servant of the servant. We have many rasas and we are supposed to aspire for different rasas, but in any case we're all servants. Okay. Uh, so whether it's conjugal rasa or sakya rasa or vatsalya rasa, we're all serving the Lord somehow or other. Here's another verse. The essence of all advice is that one should utilize one's full time 24 hours a day in chanting and remembering the Lord's divine name, transcendental form, qualities and eternal pastimes and thereby gradually engaging one's tongue and mind. In this way one should reside in Vrindavan and serve Krishna under the guidance of his beloved associates. This is taken from the Upadesh Amrita. This is guidance for the uh, devotee. Here it says one should engage himself, himself 24 hours a day in chanting and remembering the Lord, so it's a very high stage. Nevertheless, this is the aspiration of the devotee to become more and more absorbed in the Supreme Lord. Okay, fine. So, any question there? This is com it's commonly accepted, maybe some people dispute it, but uh, more, I think most people accept it as his verses. Uh, I, I, even in the time of Lord Chaitanya, or after, slightly after they were accepting it, because in Chaitanya Charitamrita, which was written not too long after his disappearance, mm -hmm. so they're, they, they're, they're recorded there, so uh, therefore they've been known for a long time. So, so 
something that he wrote at different times, not just wrote the whole eight uh, I'm not really known, there's no detail, we don't have any details about that. Mm. So, obviously he spoke so many instructions to his followers, so is there some significance to, as opposed to speaking and writing down? It generally we find that the great acharyas they write things. So we have, for instance, Ramanuja Acharya. So he wrote specific uh, keystone works, so to speak, like his commentary on the Brahma Sutras. That was a milestone of mm -hmm. refutation of Shankar's philosophy. So that had to be written down because otherwise it's it's such a, uh, intricate arguments are given there and. The, of course, the Maya bodies can respond to that also and then write their counter arguments. But this was a, uh, a monumental work of refutation, so it had to be written down because he had to go through all of Shankar's arguments in the Brahma Sutras and defeat each one. So necessarily it had to be written down. And then he wrote other works also in the same line to uh, defend his own position of Vishishtadvaita and counter Maya particularly Maya philosophy. So it required a lot of writing. Similarly, we have Madhavacharya writing works as well to uh, defeat uh, Shankaracharya. So he also wrote a commentary in the Brahma Sutras. Mm. Generally, we find that the uh, uh, founders of Sampradayas, they should write a commentary on the Brahma Sutras and Bhagavad Gita and mm. Vishnu Sahasranama. So then that's what they all did. Yeah, so actually this is uh, Lord Chaitanya himself, uh, we see speaks a lot in Chaitanya Charitamrita and he gives instructions to Rupa and Sanatan and Sarvabhambhavacharya and Ramananda Roy and others. So from that we can gather the main points and then the Goswamis and Vrindavan mainly, they were the ones that recorded all of this. So we can say that they were fo simply following his instructions and re or recording his, his statements into uh, making them consistent. I would think that probably one reason for this is that he was so absorbed in prema that he couldn't spend his time going through all the scriptures and writing things down. <laughs> so he was, uh, he just gave that to other people to do. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. Humility has its place. At the same time, we have other moods like virya or rodra. We have, uh, you know, seven secondary rasas. And in some of these rasas, there will be expressions of the opposite tendency to humility. We'll find that even in Radharani. Man means anger. So the gopis get angry at Krishna. How can you be humble if you're angry at Krishna or blaming Krishna for this or that or whatever? So it looks like they're proud. <laughs> Man also means pride. Yeah. So the gopis do that sometimes also. Uh, and in different, uh, generally if it's Dasya Rasa, they, they, they can't show too much pride because they're always supposed to be humble. But then if they're in Virya Rasa, then they show some sort of pride also because they fighting Rasa, you know. So therefore, they will show some pride there. Uh, but in general, of course, Dasya Rasa, not so much pride. In uh, Sakya Rasa also, there is pride. And therefore, the, uh, the cowherd boys, they fight, they fight with each other and they sometimes wrestle with Krishna also. Or they have games with Krishna and they try to defeat Krishna. <laughs> Krishna is weak and I'm very strong. Like this, and they, they, they fight with them. So again, it looks like pride or something there. But actually, it is, these are um, secondary rasas that um, manifest for a short period of time and then disappear. But they add some taste to the general rasa. Mm -hmm. 
So similarly with the gopis, sometimes it looks like they're proud, but then we also see they're the greatest in humility as well. So in that way, it uh, looks a little bit contradictory, but actually it's all within uh, the major rasas, which ultimately, uh, they, I mean, in, in those rasas, they accept themselves as uh, servant of the servant of the servant. So yes, and uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, we also know that um, if you're going to be attacked by a tiger, you don't just sit there and say, Hare Krishna, <laughs> you may run away <laughs> or whatever. So in different circumstances, we do have to protect our body also. And this is also the instruction of Lord Chaitanya, uh, who was Raghunath, I think, one or two, uh, end his life. But then Lord Chaitanya said, don't do that. Uh, so. Uh, we do have to uh, protect our body for the sake of service to the Supreme Lord. Uh, so like uh, the, this idea of man or whatever manifesting in, within prema itself, even for devotees in sadhana, the, the general tendency of course, the primary principle is we're humble and compassionate uh, in relation to our own self and then to other living entities we're compassionate, we're humble in relation and tolerant in relation to our own self but uh, according to the situation we may show qualities that may look a little bit opposite <laughs> so uh, the devotee may get angry as we see Hanuman gets angry and starts attacking uh, in Ravana's troops uh, so sometimes anger and stuff can be useful and for other devotees, even in sadhana, it's helpful. But we have to be careful also that it's, uh, the material tendencies don't manifest in the, that process as well. Uh, devotees who are on the highest rasas, yes, they're exhibiting secondary rasas often when they exhibit these qualities. But if we're doing sadhana, then we have to be careful that we're not just manifesting material qualities which will pollute our bhakti. But as I said, we do have to protect the devotees uh, stand up for the Supreme Lord and uh, in that respect then it may look sometimes that we're not just being tolerant of the situation etc. One of the even the principles of bhakti, the 20th Anga of bhakti is don't tolerate criticism of the <laughs> Supreme Lord of the devotees. So for ourselves we accept the criticism but for others we don't. this way someplace. Mm-hmm. Where was it? <laughs> it was before that? It was before that. Oh, okay, it was there. This one. So what was the question? What is a grave heart? Uh, it means profound in the sense, very deep heart. Uh, in other words, they're not superficial in their feelings. They have profound feelings. <laughs> 
very serious heart, so you can say, uh, not disturbed by other, um, or not distracted in any way, yeah, profound. Oh, here it says, of course, it's Gambira, Bhava Gambira Chittan. Uh, that means, uh, Gambira means very deep actually. Uh, or uh, actually, for Krishna, the, the word Gambira is often used meaning profound, and you can't really understand what he's thinking or what he's doing because it's a little puzzling, but he has his own ideas and we can't understand what it is. So, in the case of the devotee, it means he is, their bhava is very deep, their emotions are very deep. Uh, so, they have very deep love for Krishna, basically, that's what it means. Till this day. Oh, I see. Uh, well, uh, Jiva Goswami always defends his position that there must be a resolution to the separation, and therefore Krishna comes back. The other uh, solution we can say is that eternally, of course, they're all going on with the eternal pastimes in the spiritual world and Aprakat Leela and Vrindavan also that we don't see. So in those pastimes they are together forever. Yeah. In um, Vishnu Chakravarti also gives another <laughs> meaning. That is that uh, after three months of staying away and after sending Uddhava there to pacify the gopis then Krishna should keep his promise of coming back soon and therefore he did yeah. or actually he did it before before he saw Uddhava um, but why we see everybody lamenting still so his explanation is that uh, everybody divided up into two forms Krishna came back and therefore they were satisfied and joyful in another form, Krishna didn't come back and he stayed in Mathura and then later he went to Dwarka, so everybody was in lamentation. So we get two forms of the Brajabhasis, uh, one form in separation and one form where he came back and that continued. <laughs> so that's his explanation based on the fact that when Uddhava went there, he saw two forms, he, he expresses a very strange thing, he saw everybody in Vrindavan very joyful the cowherds were calling the cows and people were milking the cows and everyone was very happy, etc. And then the next moment there's a whole description where he meets Nanda and Yasoda and the kitchen stoves are dead, there's no fire, they're not cooking anymore, they're, they're lamenting, everybody's lamenting. So we get two contrasting pictures of Vrindavan by Uddhava. He sees two different things, so therefore he says, these are the two visions we have, or the two worlds that are simultaneously going on. Krishna has come back and they're very joyful. Other, he didn't come back. So he says after some time, he did come back and kept his promise to Nanda Maharaj. When Nanda left Mathura and came back, I'll come back soon, he came back. After some, let's say month or so, or whatever, a month and a half, and he came back. Uh, so that's one solution to the problem. Other one, there were separation or waited. But then, even Vishnu Chakravarti says that even that form of separation resolved finally when Krishna came back after killing Dantavakra. And that's described in the Padma Purana. And therefore he came back and everyone was happy after that. And then he made them all disappear and they went into their eternal pastimes. And then one form went back to Dwarka and continued pastimes in Dwarka. So in that way there was a union in either case for uh, Jiva Goswami or for Vishwanath also in two ways.
uh, maybe even again as new I word that doesn't get to the depth of some of the translations. So mm. I'm wondering why we read the translation that we do and where it's where it's coming oh, from. Oh, um, that one's probably from the Chitin Shatamrita, I'm not sure, but probably from that. Or, actually there's another translation that came out previously, Prabhupada did a translation that was very common in the early days. So maybe it's that translation, I'm not sure actually. Well you can check Chaitanya Charmada, it's not that one, it must be the other one previously because he did some translation long, long ago before the Chaitanya Charmada came out. Maybe it is that one, I'm not sure. So this is a couple of times done, this, this one, the one we're reading. The one I didn't know, I made my own translation out of just the grammatic, just a gra- grammatical explanation of the words there. Yeah. Yours is quite a great one from Bunny quotes recently, where I guess probably has done the synonyms for the... Oh, okay, and yeah. Translated it and yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think probably in the Chaitanya Charmada, the synonyms are also given, because they give synonyms usually for everything there in Chaitanya Charmada. Uh, yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you.